Yeah. So we've got, I think we're expecting about four or five more people. So just give it a few minutes. It's nearly two o'clock, so just give it a Tell you what, people are now arriving thick and fast. It may be easiest if I just read out my names rather than try and cross-reference my attendance list. Um, I have somebody called Emily Elliston. Yep, that's fine. Okay, let me admit her. Um, Jake Richards. Yep. Yeah, he's good. Okay. Lovely. Oh, Councillor. Yeah, there we are. Um, Simon Lister. Yes. yes. Super. Um, Julia Creer. Julia who? Julia Creer. C R E A R. Yep. Living Streets. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. And oh, W F U K. I recognise that organisation. That's Joe from Goodness Foundation. Okay. Yeah. And that is currently everybody. Well, as it's just gone two o'clock, shall we kick off and you can admit them as we go along? I think. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Well, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you're all fit and well and looking forward to this. Uh, I'm going to make a slight change to the agenda that was sent out because Rob Pilly has got to go to a, a, another meeting. Uh, where his important skills will be utilised. So instead of him doing it as a communications update from 3.40 to 3.50, I'm going to give him 10 minutes to start from now. Thank you very much indeed. Essex is green. Uh, the number of followers on our Essex is green Facebook page continues to grow at a rate of around 1% to 2% per week. And in recent weeks, we've continued to use the thought-provoking quick content to grow the reach in order to increase the visibility of longer form content and transactional items about council-related schemes and programs. For example, the followers really enjoyed reading the words of wisdom from a forest ranger in Yosemite National Park about the challenges when designing a litter bin that is both bear-proof and accessible for the most careless of tourists. So very appropriate in Essex. This was followed by the image showing a fatberg under the streets of London that demonstrates why it isn't a very good idea to flush oils, fats and baby wipes down the, down the drain. Following this pattern is allowing the channel to reach around 200 to 300,000 news feeds every month on Facebook, which is staggering. In terms of the Essex's Green Discussion Group, the membership has grown by 7% to a total of around about 637 members. Our membership comprises largely female members who make up 60% of the total memberships with males just over 30%. In terms of engagement, our total amount of group posts are around uh, up by 60% a month by month, which is a great to see. In terms of member locations, the majority are concentrated in the following order, Chelmsford, Malden, Colchester, Southend and Holstead. Our best performing posts this month uh, were around the circular fashion economy lab-grown sustainable meat and transition to electric vehicles. Our best received member feature was around the litter action called Clean Up Chelmsford, run by three Chelmsford teenage environmentalists who gained 70 volunteers after we ran the feature. The Essex's Green Group is running on an online meeting with members this Friday to enable direct engagement with group members and to get their input on how we can shape them and moving forwards. You will be excited to hear that a broad structure of our new commission website has been worked up and a copy for the website is currently being written. Last month saw the first external Essex Climate Action Commission newsletter, which was sent to an initial 87 subscribers. The total amount of subscribers has subsequently gone up to 144, and we're looking at a further promotion of the newsletter to continue to grow the number of subscriptions. Information about the commission and its work is featured in a number of other newsletters, including the Essex Chamber of Commerce, Essex Association of Local Councils and Essex Partners as we continue to increase awareness of the Commission's work. We've continued to promote the Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme and last month we saw the completion of the first work carried out under the scheme. 
We're currently planning the final report launch event and developing a proposal for various options. As we're in the early stages of planning, which we will be shortly sharing with the Community Engagement Working Group. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, great, I don't know, has anybody got any questions on that? I can't see any. Very, very good, Rob, thanks very much. No worries. Excellent. Well, I think then we'll, we'll crack on with the agenda, actually, as, um, as Dan. We're actually on, on, on time with it. Uh, obviously didn't spend enough time welcoming you. Um, so we're now going to have a presentation of the review of the final report structures. Uh, and it's going to be bring, bringing through all the outputs from the meetings. And uh, I'm going to now hand over to Joe Roberts from the Wilderness Foundation. No. I think. Yes, no, I'm here. Thank you, Lord Randall. Excellent. Um, Thanks everybody. Uh, a big welcome. Good to see everybody again. I think we're all going to miss each other when this all ends. It's been lovely to see you all. Um, just to really frame what we're doing today, I think is really important. Um, and to say that the purpose of what we're trying to achieve with this final report is to agree a proposed structure of what that end product um, at the end of June is going to look like. We're very keen that this is seen as the first critical step um, in the journey towards this. Um, we want to be clear, just to make really sure that everyone is, it understands the process and the structure, that this is not the content of what will be in the final report. And certainly um, the commissioners and the um, council officials working on this want to make sure um, that what's gone in in terms of all of that hard work on our SIGs um, is going to be really put forward through in the, in the, in the final report um, and to make sure that that commitment is there. And once we're all content with what this approach in terms of the structure looks like, then the back end will be filling in all those spaces and making it work. And I just wanted again, as we always um, acknowledge an enormous thank you to the staff team and the council officials in the background making a lot of this work. Um, very grateful and to my fellow commissioners who put in a huge amount of work. Um, next slide. So in terms of setting the scene, uh, this is our proposal in terms of what that uh, structure would look like. You know, we've spent quite a bit of time debating how to make it as user friendly as possible. Um, and this is kind of what we've come up with at this point in terms of the index of, of uh, content. So, you know, obviously an opening and engaging statement carried on by commission in our challenge, a vision statement that people would be agreeing together carbon modeling uh, with the timeline, uh, recommendations, uh, the climate focus area, etc. I don't need to go through it, but I think we've really wanted to try and create a user-friendly, community-friendly uh, approach that's not going to be too heavy on officialdom to keep it very light and, and very easy to, to follow. Um, the majority of our presentation will be going through each section of how we envisage the report being structured. And it had a similar approach, um, as you will notice, to the interim report with sections such as recommendations and next steps. And the majority of the presentation, we're going through all those little bits of, of structure. Um, and we've used quite a lot of examples uh, to make that feel more understandable. Um, so in the slides to come, you'll be seeing some of those templates um, of what that looks like. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, so the slides will have templates that you'll be picking up on. Um, we'll be making sure that everything uh, fits with accessibility um, standards and doing this we'll be following the county council brand book. So this is an example showing you what the council brand book looks like now. Obviously we'll be working within that framework to make it feel really user friendly um, going forward and how it actually fits with our climate um, action commission. Um, and we'll make sure that whatever we're doing is going to fit with all these, these other uh, guidelines, such as Mighty and Ringway Jacobs. Um, when you see the examples in the slides, again, just reiterating that these are just examples and not exactly what the end product will, will look like. Um, next slide, please. I love the slide because I, I think it really does tie in the holistic side of what we've been trying to create in our different six and the work that we've been working on. 
And here in this um, idea of the structure, we want to make sure that we've kept this idea of golden threads running through what the final report will look like and making sure we're keeping people engaged and promoting a sense of consistency throughout all these interim phases and the reports that the public might have seen. We want to make sure that it's, it flows into the final report. And we really want the general public, individuals, young people, whoever, to really understand the content of it. Again, putting quite a lot of thought into the communication. How are we going to make sure that that is palatable for a wide range of people? And one of our pressures in terms of what the report will look like is that's not something that's just going to go on the shelf, that it's going to be something that people will really feel is a tool and a manual and something that they can feel part of. And that, again, running through our communication theme, it's that we feel that we're doing this together rather than a top-down approach of telling people what to do. Um, we want to come away from a very traditional corporate look and jargon and make it eye-catching, something people want to read and engage with. Um, and I think also there's that enormous sense of crisis. Uh, I think it's something we all feel very strongly about that we bring across that this is a climate crisis. It's not something to just, you know, park somewhere to gain dust. We've got to do something now. Um, and we want to get that approach of what you do today will affect tomorrow. Um, and again, going back, we want to make sure that those narratives are all cohesive, that they all flow, and this wonderful stitching is going to run through. So I'm now going to pass over to Professor Jackie McGlade, who's going to continue to set the scene for the report. Um, is Jackie with us? Sorry. Ah, yes. sorry, 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 sorry. I was trying to, I was trying to not be too distracted and actually have my, have my uh, picture, picture not open. So um, let me, uh, let me just, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next slide is sort of take you through setting the scene. Um, and really is to talk about the first section of the report is we want to have engaging statements and it's going to be based around making it everyone's business. We talked about this, how to get everyone involved and making sure that everyone feels that they can contribute, but they're not going to be alone. So about public, obviously, we've had long discussions, but it's also about business. It's also about people recognizing they have multiple roles and at the same time, trying to get this sort of sense of urgency. We do want to get endorsement. So I don't know if all of you were in that conversation or it's been relayed into other settings that we're looking for um, quotes, but also people who can really set the scene that lift this report from Essex into something which maybe someone might pick up elsewhere in the UK and elsewhere in the world and think, okay, this is, this is a, a great case example of people who've worked together. What we want to do though, is to set the tone right. It's got to have both the local scene setting and it's got to connect to the global. Next slide, please. Um, obviously within the interim report, we, we need to have the forwards and we need to really respect, in a sense, those people who've led us, the leader of the council, we'll see how that operates in the next uh, few weeks, but also Lord Randall. And, and this will still be the case for the final report. So these are examples. Um, we may have to uh, think a little bit about making them very readable, but uh, I think generally it's very important that we have that set. So these are just some examples that you can see from other action plans. We're not trying to put words into the mouth of, of uh, John at all, but, but certainly we're going to have to have some words of wisdom and really setting this out. And this is really the political backdrop, but it's not to say that Essex is doing everything. Next slide, please. Now, the opening statement is probably the most crucial thing because we need to set the scene about why urgency is required what the current situation is that we're in, but it also has to really explain what the commission is, you know, who we are, the challenges we're facing as a county, but also how the commission fits in and the sort of independent role. And there are some examples here of others that have done this. And um, we're not gonna go into so much detail in terms of data, because these are gonna be in the separate technical annexes. But what we want to do is we want to make reference to data points. So things that have come through the SIGs where we want to hang our messages are going to be vital. And obviously, we're going to have a vision that's going to bring 2030 right into the center. So the opening statement already sets up the rest of the report saying, we're going to be acting 
urgently in the next couple of years, but also we are bringing forward some of these deadlines that have been talked about more generally. So this is not just a simple set of words, it's really setting our ambition as high as we can. Um, next slide, please. But as you can see, we really want to get statements out that will relate to different audience groups and how they could take responsibility in tackling climate change, but some of the synergies as well. So somehow in these vision statements, we want people to read this through and say, oh yeah, that's for me. Oh, that's where I can fit in. So in terms of making changes and the cross cutting between sectors, it should be that someone can read a statement and realize that um, they're relevant there, but they can also contribute to others. So this is gonna be, I think, probably the hardest part to, to work through. But I think overall, there's gotta be something for everybody here and what role they're going to play and how they can fit into this big jigsaw. So I'm gonna hand over to Roger now, who's gonna talk about how we're bringing the content of the report into, uh, the content of all our SIGs into the report itself. So over, over to Roger, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I'm Roger and I'm gonna take you through the next four slides uh, where we start to go into more detail of what we recommend uh, and how we are tracking progress. Obviously, this is the structure, not the full content has been uh, said earlier. So within this section, we'll look at uh, how we're going to create a roadmap of the journey that we're expecting to make so that Essex can meet net zero by 2050. We're at the beginning stages in understanding how this will look and what we will be able to achieve. We're expecting to have this section produced by May. It's worth noting that this roadmap is crucial in determining what the evaluation and monitoring will also look like. And it will be an ongoing journey. Also, we expect uh, this roadmap or timeline to become a source that people can track and understand in a simple way in terms of where we started and where we aim to get to. Uh, next slide. The majority of the report will be focusing on the recommendations. The recommendations will be broken down into SIG areas such as transport, energy and waste and community engagement. To briefly explain, we're proposing each section will discuss the background. Again, minimal data as this will be discussed in the technical annex. The background consists of where we are now and what is the current state of play. We then go on to uh, where we want to get to, and this contains a number of targets where possible. And finally, we will focus on how, how we are going to get there. This will be formed by summarizing the recommendations and stating any actions required. Just to note, throughout the recommendations, we will be mentioning different audience groups. For example, not only will retrofitting homes affect residents. It will also impact the developers and businesses and so on. So we considered writing this report with an audience lens. However, we did not want people to skip over the parts of the report and only read the sections that they thought related to them. More, we wanted them to read the report as a whole so that it tells a story and so that they can see their part within that wider story. Uh, this section will be supported by crib sheets, one focused on the SIG and others towards audience groups. Uh, these will contain a full list of recommendations relevant to the sections. Uh, this will be explained more uh, later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. For this section on the climate focus area, it will be written as a pilot study where we, we highlight one of the innovative, forward-thinking pieces of work, in this case, the Blackwater and Colne catchments and what we're proposing for that area. In brief, uh, for those who don't know, we've proposed a climate focus area, which allows us to focus on particular areas within the county and to develop net zero carbon as quickly as possible. 
In this case, the focus is on the Blackwater and Colne catchment areas, and we're aiming that by 2050, 30% of land in Essex will be defined as natural green infrastructure. Next slide, please. As I said earlier in the presentation, the monitoring and evaluation section will link closely to the carbon modelling timeline. From the work that is happening on the timeline, it will produce some monitoring and evaluation examples. We're likely to go with a hybrid approach of the two examples, both with a clear table and providing some context and narrative. And I'll pass you on to Joe, who will discuss the last few sections of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Roger. So um, just this morning on Radio 4, I don't know if any of you picked it up, was this idea that um, changing behaviour is actually stimulated by neighbourhoods and communities. So if some per one person starts doing something, it has this wonderful kind of roll-on effect where others will pick it up and want to be part of the action. I think it's just a human condition, to be honest. But what we've been thinking within the reporting and putting the structure together was how we could stimulate that kind of community rollout. And one of the ways that we thought of doing that um, was to build um, this idea of best practice examples. So people could actually see what someone else is doing and think, wow, that's a really good idea. I could do that. Um, and it definitely works from a kind of behavior persuasion point of view, but it's also very genuine. So what we're doing is going to be asking multiple partners across the county to tell us what they've been doing already in best practice and how to share that wider uh, within the structure of the report. So we'll be weaving all of that through the report, which will be aligned to different focus areas. So for example, you know, my passion of course is on the land and green, green infrastructure SIG and how case studies or examples of that will, will spread through as you would do for transport and energy, et cetera. And uh, for example, a best practice action or mini case study or pledge will be based on, on examples of that. So for example, on the left, there'll be the one with the little globe will be those kind of pledges and examples throughout uh, the, the report is what we're envisaging. Um, next slide, please. We also thought that this idea of pledges um, is really important to helping create some momentum and again, examples that will keep others um, inspired and to replicate new or, or existing ideas. I think, you know, what's, what we've talked about so much in the SIGs and the communication strategy was really, um, if somebody's already doing something good, let's make more of it um, and replicate it um, and then add new things to it. So we'll take a similar approach to the slide before with the best practice to make sure again that um, pledges are weaved right through, woven right through the report in the different areas and focus groups. And one of the other things that we know is really important in behavior change is something about accountability. And the idea is if you've put your name to a pledge, there's a really wonderful process that then happens because you definitely don't want to lose face and not do it. So the more accountability we can build in, uh, the best chance we've got of something happening. And so we also want to use uh, an idea like this page with the pledges and the, and the different um, ideas of uh, best practice is that we can get more people to sign up and more people to get involved. And that could be individuals, businesses, it could be community action groups, it could be parish councils, um, schools, et cetera. So there's an amazing amount of multiplicity of what we could do with that. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so by the next steps, we're looking at what could that critical action look like for the next five to 10 years. Again, from behavior change, we know if we've got something to focus on, we're much more likely to get towards it than to not have something to focus on. Um, as we've said before, we're in a climate crisis. We're not in a, in a softball game here. Um, and we really need to make sure we use every tool in the box to make sure that we keep momentum and we're driving this forward. Um, we're all very committed to that. Um, again, here are some ideas uh, of different other people who've done things to focus on the future, to keep us on track. Um, and we really want through ongoing consultation um, to work on how we want our report um, to reflect the outcomes of the commissioners and the SIGs. So I'll now hand over back to Roger. He'll go through the last couple of slides with you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. 
Uh, I'm going to take you through the last few slides before we take any questions. Uh, as we're wanting members of the public to be able to pick up the report and understand what it's about, we feel that a glossary is key in aiding that understanding. We'll create our own Essex version, but it'll be similar to the Nottingham and Birmingham examples that you see on the slide in terms of providing uh, context to the meaning of the word and not just expanding on the acronym. Uh, it's no good just saying retrofitting or green infrastructure when people are not clear what we mean by that. Next slide, please. Uh, as Jackie alluded to earlier, rather than weighing the report down with a lot of evidence-based data, we'll be making reference to this technical annex throughout. The annex will be a detailed section where we will have expanded on the data from the main body of the report and provided clear infographics to help effectively communicate the detailed content. Uh, next slide, please. The crib sheets are a follow-on from the recommendations section. It's here where we will expand on the recommendations and provide uh, opportunities for people to pledge what they're going to do. I think this is a really exciting way of encouraging engagement with the report and of ensuring that the recommendations actually lead to action. If you like to use religious language, the recommendations lead to uh, what we would call a rule of life. Uh, and I can have a rule of life for my household, uh, but I can also look out to do business with commercial enterprises that have themselves signed up to and pledged to a rule of life. Uh, the crib sheets will be broken down in two ways. Firstly, uh, a version of different SIG groups uh, for example, all transport recommendations in one table, energy and waste in another, in another, and so on. The, the other will be by audience grouping, as we've talked about earlier. All recommendations for businesses will be collated together to enable businesses to see directly the role that they can play and be able to pledge what they will do based on the recommendations provided. We feel that it is this section where audiences will be able to take leadership and own what they're going to do to tackle climate change and start to understand how their role plays an important part in the bigger picture. Next slide, please. Uh, giving everyone time to review, feedback and amend the report, we feel is important and we want to ensure that you get the opportunity to do just that. As you can see, we proposed a timeline of drafting the report and SIG amendments by May. In May, we're wanting to encompass everyone's feedback. It's here where the feedback from the different SIG groups and all the commissioners will be invaluable. From this, we'll go on into June, where we can all start the design phase, looking forward to the publication of the report. Uh, next slide, please. Lastly, to think about once the report has been finalised and published, uh, we don't want to stop there. We're starting to explore some of the things that we could do to get the word out there about this report and explore different ways that we can encourage people to engage with the report, to read the report. I won't go through them all, but just select a couple of the ideas that came up. We're exploring the idea of a toolkit that will be aimed at uh, different audience groups to give them the tools to make changes, such as creating a list of quick wins that people can do in their own homes or workplaces. Uh, we, we're looking at building a website which will contain these toolkits and become a platform where people are able to pledge and interact with the website. And we recognise that a barrier to people not reading the report can be due to a lack of time. Well, if there's one thing this pandemic has done, it's encouraged people to get outside and walk more. And by creating a series of podcasts or an audio version of the report, uh, will be a great way of helping people to listen to the report as well as getting their daily exercise. 
We're currently working on a launch event for the final report and we'll be plastering the good work that we're doing collectively across the country. Ultimately, climate change is everyone's business. We can make a difference and start turning things around. And this report is just one step in adding to that uh, and facilitating that process of change. So on behalf of Joe, Jackie and myself uh, and the brilliant team that we've been working with, I'd like to say thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to us. And if you have any questions, uh, then we'd be pleased to take them. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, inspiring stuff. My, my, uh, the thing that really comes through, I do think, is, is, is trying to make this accessible. Um, I suppose like uh, quite a few people on this call uh, or on this meeting, um, we're all presented with large reports sometimes. And I'm afraid sometimes um, the, uh, the, 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 the immediate reaction when you look at it, this is going to be interesting, but you get bogged down in the first couple of pages. And there's too many, too many technical things, for, especially for somebody who's a, a lay person. So I think yeah, that's very important. Now, I've already got a couple of people wanting to come in. Uh, I've got uh, Jules Pretty, Pretty coming in and then uh, Councillor Ann Turrell and then some more. But uh, we'll, we'll start off with those two, please. So, Jules. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And thanks very much for the presentations. That was great. Um, I've just got three kind of major points to make. Um, I mean, I think the structure is good. Um, I think the Word document that Sam sent around yesterday gives us a kind of sense of, of how those slides translate into a linear document. Um, uh, and so I just want to kind of step back a moment and just to kind of make a couple of, of I think, important points. Uh, first of all, the, the, actually the smallest one of the lot. Can we make sure that CO2, when it's in reports, has a lower case for the two? I mean, these are little things, but, but you know, it's like just making an egregious spelling error. We, sh we shouldn't be picking the... Phil, Sam, can you make sure that we check on those? Um, let me go back a mo moment or two. Um, we agreed this a year ago, that we would be bold and ambitious, that we wanted this commission to play a leadership role, as uh, Roger was just saying. We want to be very clear about targets for um, uh, the county council, but also for other partners within the wider county of Greater Essex. And we wanted accountability to achieve those um, uh, and you know, play a leadership role in the, the point that we're in, in 2021. Noting that some of those targets, you know, we're already a year into uh, achieving them by 2030. So we've got to be really, really kind of sharp and hard hitting. Um, uh, there I had, um, and uh, some others also, had some considerable concerns when we read the first um, uh, showing of the interim report. Some of these were misunderstandings, some were cleared up by Sam's email yesterday. Um, I personally was worried that this was beginning to look like a deliberate dumbing down, a watering down of what we were trying to achieve. I'm sure that that's not actually deliberate. I think these are sins of omission rather than commission. And I've got one very specific recommendation to make in a moment. Um, I don't much care for the examples drawn from elsewhere because some of them are actually not very good. They're just sort of picked um, off the branches as it were. Um, you know, we, we're gonna need to pick ones that we really think um, we're gonna stand by rather than just a range of ones from Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, wherever else. Um, and I was concerned that we didn't have anything on the SIGs. The, the huge amount of work has gone into those um, up to this point, but I can see that they can be fed back in. But I'm also a bit worried when we keep saying, we're gonna just put all the, all the data and numbers and graphs in a technical, technical annex. No, graphs and numbers tell stories just as words do. We're gonna to need to be, make sure that they are accessible. I buy that completely. Uh, but we don't want to shunt all that good work off into some distant um, annex. So that, that worries me. And I think we need to get that into this central part of the report. Um, so I am reassured, reassured, but I've got three big things. One is that we don't actually have minutes of meetings to go back on to check on what we've, what we've agreed. Um, can I propose that we actually do have an agreed record of, of these meetings and the SIG meetings? Um, and that they are signed off by the chair. Sorry, John, job to you. 
um, and then distributed so that we can all see them in advance. Um, it's kind of convenient just to assume that everyone is, is kind of on top of stuff, but, but some of the problems that emerged were because none of us could go back and look at minutes. Um, secondly, the big thing is um, I can see what we were trying to do with the thing called the vision, but I don't like it. I think we should drop it completely. It's clever, it's half elegant, um, it asks the reader to imagine being in a place 10 years from now, 2031. Sam, in your message yesterday, you said 15, but I think it's 10. Um, uh, we imagine that we've kind of got to the point and we're looking back. But I think it actually ends up looking weak. The language in it is feeble in the end, and it takes us away from the clarity of targets and actions. So I'd like to replace that vision completely. A vision is a short statement um, you know, the greenest county in Britain, the greenest county in the world, um, the lowest carbon footprints. That's our vision. OK, I get that. It's not all this kind of 10 statements of, that come across as a dense page. And you know what? Nobody's going to read that. They absolutely aren't. Um, so I think we need to go back to targets and actions. By 2030, we will have reduced carbon emissions in the county by a half. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is that we agree. Um, so I think we need to look forward, not go forward and look back. So I would cut that, cut that completely. I don't think it works at all. Um, my second, uh, my third point um, is uh, about contradictions. Um, and this is something that we maybe haven't discussed before, but I wanted to raise in this meeting. And it actually did come up from when we were, when, when Roger was talking about, you know, getting, people to take responsibility, Joe was saying this as well from the community, you know, kind of making pledges and so forth. Um, we need a line of work, I would recommend, that uh, checks that there are not major contradictions from Essex County Council and from members, key members of this commission um, or key actors. So I would have thought the leader of the council, the chief executive, Gavin, um, the chair to the commission, John, and others, um, are you still driving big gas guzzling cars? Could someone take a picture of you on the day this report is released and say, that was great, but here you are driving a car that does 10 miles to the gallon. Um, are, you, are you paying attention to sustainable plant-based diets? Um, have you cut your flying? Well, yes, we've all done that, but are we all gonna jump back on again in a short period of time? Um, uh, jumping to Essex County Council, have we disinvested from all fossil fuels as a county? Can we be absolutely reassured of that? Because when we produce this report and we want it to have a big bang, then a little investigative reporter does a bit of work and says, that's all very well, but here's a picture of somebody in their big car and it's not electric. And they said, everyone should drive electric cars. And here they are eating a hamburger in the, in the, in the local town. And you know what? They're still investing in fossil fuels in, by, by the county. Now, I don't know the answers to any of those. And I've been unfair to name three, three key actors because the same can apply to all of us. Um, there are, of course, contradictions. I'm holding a pen. It's plastic. All right. Contradictions. They're there all the time, but it's the size of them. Are they big enough to hold us below the water? Um, and we've each got to be able to say, yes, I do this. I do that. I do the other. I'm, I'm making an effort. Um, and if we can't do that, then we have a big hole that we're going to walk into. And, and the reason I'm raising this now, not when the report is done, is that we should be doing a line of work to identify those. And we as individuals on the commission, um, secretariat, as well as commissioners, should be thinking about kind of personal responsibility there. And I, Gavin, I've got to finger you, I'm afraid, with your lovely um, pictures in the background of Finching Field by the looks of it. Um, uh, but I just think that we, you know, you've got to be, got to be consistent with the content of the report, and we mustn't fall into any traps with that. Um, so uh, a final point is then uh, just to make that point again about the good work of the SIGs. Please, let's not shuffle them all off to distant annexes. Um, let's make sure that we pick the good stuff. And I do think that we should be saying something in the main report about individual carbon footprints. We've done a chunk of work of that in the, the green, uh, the, the land use and green infrastructure SIG, 
Uh, we've got indications for what farmers can do. We've got indications for what individual consumers can do. Um, I think that that should be in the main report, but we can discuss that later, but I'm just making that point now. So that's me done at the moment. I was worried. I thought we were heading down a, a rather kind of rocky road, um, uh, but I think that, the, that I'm reassured that that's not the case, even if it might have looked that way. Um, but I think the key thing now is clear, concise targets that say why this is so different and actually what is going to be achieved by 2030. Um, uh, and then we can all be signing up to that. And I just ditched the, the vision. Sorry, nice bit of work. But, you know, when it comes, when push comes to shove, good work does have to, have to go by the wayside from time to time when you're editing. I think it was good, good effort. I was quite keen on it. I drop it now um, and, okay. and have a line of work focusing on, on the targets and action. So sorry to go on a bit, but I had several things that we as commissioners had been discussing over the weekend since the, um, the, the package came at the end of last week. Um, I hope that's helped um, uh, clarify a few things, but also set them out for the future as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jules. There's quite a lot to think about in there. I'm going to just go straight to Sam uh, Kennedy, actually, uh, to respond on some of those before we get to the next set of questions. I've got you all, I can see you all lined up there with your hands up, but you don't have to keep them held up. But um, anyway, so Sam. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> just to give some reassurance that the examples used were just to illustrate potential ways of, of um, setting out our own um, uh, examples and our own recommendations and our own targets. None of the material that will be in uh, the final report will come from other places. Um, all of the best practice examples will be Essex best practice examples. All of the targets and recommendations will be the work of the uh, commission. And I just wanted to reiterate that and give some assurance on that point. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I, th I think also it is a very useful point Jules made about minutes, actually. I know they're recorded, but it's not not the same as, as, as minutes. So I think that's something we could look at. And also on the point of uh, whether we'd all be... You know, if the paparazzi follow you around and then uh, f find you're not living up to your standards, uh, I have to say that having had a political career, I think I uh, not only try to do it myself, but also advise people either never to, to, to make such bold statements that you can't be kept to or, or just be wary of what you're what you're advocating for other people if you don't do it yourself. With that, I shall move to Councillor Anne Turrell. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, but my main point was about how we present this to people. A big report with all these wonderful things in which basically I agree with um, is not going to be read by most members of the public. And if we want the members of the public to actually engage with this and actually do things, what I suggest and what I normally do in my, in my case over the years is with a big report, I would have a, um, I call it an idiot's report. It isn't really. It's just maybe two or three a4 size papers, A4 size, and it will just have the headlines in. And if those people think, oh, I'm interested in that, I want to go to it, then they can go to the report and read all the detail. But giving a big report like this to a lot of people, it will just turn them off. Um, I know there's some other suggestions that were brought forward about uh, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, and the website, but not everybody wants to use the website and the Facebook. They might want to read some were. So it was just a suggestion that we do have a small, very concise report about what we've been doing on this commission. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to go to Graham Underwood. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for the presentations. I, like Jules, I was rather concerned about the original draft that came through last week, and I think Sam's email, either was it yesterday, was really helpful, and then what we've heard today and what Sam's just said. So I think a couple of thoughts and then also some comments about how we present this. I, I do think it runs the risk of becoming very turgid and worthy and not very accessible. Um, and I'm getting the impression this will be a sort of big PDF report with some nice images and things on. I, I just think there's a real risk that it then goes on a shelf like all the other reports we've got on our shelves and, and it doesn't become a live and living thing. So 
I was surprised, I, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I was surprised on the vision statements. I know we've heard that they're going to be perhaps changed, but I thought they were really um, just very generic and bland actually. And it, I know Jules doesn't want us to have a vision statement, but if we do, it should be really just a few and it should say things like, we will, or we will buy, and then some very specific comments, not the, um, you know, hopefully buy something, something nice will be on the way. You know, it's, it's just too loose when we're in this sort of emergency situation where we need dynamic action. And that brings me to my point. Most of the work of the commission so far has been through the SIGs and there's been amazing work done on the SIGs. Um, and so I think the SIG work should be absolutely core to the whole report, not, and then there's some SIGs and here you can go. Because if you think of those SIG presentations, we've had some fantastic graphics, some fantastic summaries in all the different SIGs that really lay the challenge on the line and put forward some very bold solutions. And we, we talked about early on that it was about being bold and challenging the council, the other stakeholders, the members of our community and ourselves to do things about that. And I think it was Roger who spoke in the presentation about the different tiers of people who we need to engage with this. Um, and there are, in all of our SIGs, I think we've talked about what needs to be done at a corporate level or a regional level and what can be done locally. So I think we can really get that message home out of the SIG work. So I think being a much more bold in the statements and let's not pretend we're well on the way um, and have, I, I noticed we had a press release out this morning from the, the council um, about, the, and it mentioned the commission and it just talked about a few very, very light touch actions actually, to be honest, uh, as if we were, you know, making a great big show of this thing. We, we really are not, um, uh, nor is anyone else. It's not critical of Essex County Council, but the sense of urgency is not really coming through. What I wanted to say about how we present all this at the end is that um, I was thinking, as people were speaking, well, so many people now live their lives with their phones or on tablets, particularly younger folk who um, spend all their time with the phones. So how are we going to make this uh, a set of information that's accessible through other forms of media? And when at the university we did some big work about looking at our strategic uh, next strategic plan, we had a lot of material on the web and the web was the source of live material. So like Anne was saying, you have your front document, but I would have thought so much of this stuff should be live and on the web. And if we want to make pledges, they can put their pledges up on the web and then those pledge pages grow. If you just publish a prep, um, some pledge pages in May, 2021, by August, they'll be out of date. It'll be so old, it'll be so static. So I think thinking about how the document becomes live and on the web, and then as progress happens, you can also update those sort of web pages and people get a sense of momentum and a sense of journey they can come along with and link to. So I wouldn't want a big fat book with pages of annexes and detailed texts and things and a glossary at the back. Uh, we should, I think, be much more dynamic than that and put it all on a really interactive website where people can put up comments and these sorts of things. I don't use Facebook, I don't know if that's the right source, but whatever it is needs to be accessible to those different types of media, including what you know, um, people who are less than 20, less than 15 look at, which is not Facebook, I understand. I understand Facebook's now a vehicle for old people. So we need to be quite clever about that. Um, and then the whole commission report and the council's response could be a more dynamic live document. Um, and I think that would give us more chance to get a sense of momentum behind these things. So as I say, you know, it's great work and we, we know we've done a huge amount of work as SIGs, all of us contributing to those things. And I think we've got um, some really good stories to build on. And I was worried, very worried when I first saw the draft, less, far less worried now, but I think we need to think out of our normal box of producing a nice report um, because I'm just actually not sure that's what we should do. I think there should be something much more lively, exciting, linking across to all the initiatives. That's the advantage of doing it through the web. Everything could be linked you can click on a place and actually get your form to get your uh, energy efficiency thing off the web straight away, straight to that point on Essex County Council, not think, oh, I'll do it later. So I think, yeah, if the good officers of the council could think about a more dynamic way of presenting all this material, I think that would make it have real impact going down the line. And that, of course, is what we want. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm planning to do is go through as people have, have put their hands up and uh, then perhaps get some people to, to respond. So I'll just let you know that I have spotted you. I've got Simon Lister's gonna be on in a second, then Gavin Jones, then James Abbott, then I've got uh, Professor McLeod and Bishop Roger so far. Um, 
So if we go straight to Simon, Lister. Um, thanks, John. And um, I'll try and keep it, it brief. Um, but firstly, thanks to Joe, Jackie and Roger and Sam and, and, and all her team. Uh, you know, terrific work, terrific presentations. And I agree with so much of what Jules and Graham and, and others have said. So, but two, two quick points. One is um, on, on the very first thing you see in the, in the report, I think one of the great things the council did was to set up an independent commission, you know, non-party political from all kinds of different places. And I think personally, when the first thing you see is, is three, and please take this, don't take this the wrong way, you politicians. The first thing you see in the report are three councillors. And you th my first thing is, oh my goodness, is this a political report? You know, and, and, I, and, I, and this isn't. I mean, the council's done a brilliant job appointing John Randall and, and, these, and these independent commissioners. And it is the commission report, as I understand it, that is then for the council to respond to. And, and so I think that right up front, it should be John, as you, our chair, and, and you know, talking about this, these independent commissioners and who they are set up to advise county, the county council on how to get to net zero. And this is what we think. Um, and and, and I, so I think it, it should, the commission should be up front rather than the, the political figures at the back. I just think it'll have better impact uh, that way. And secondly, it was really to agree with what's been said about the vision statements. And I confess I was involved in drafting at least a couple of them. And, and I, I'm not so sure about them. I, I, I think that our vision is pretty clear. We want Essex to be net zero by 2050. And it's gonna be challenging, it's gonna to be tough. We need everybody to help. Um, but to me, that is pretty strong and enough. And I think having 10 vision statements sort of distracts rather. You, you sort of look at those statements and how are they different? And so maybe have a short, sharp one, as I think Jules was suggesting, but, but I, I would be inclined to drop them because I think they are a bit, a, a bit distracting. Um, and that's it. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I'm now going to go to Gavin Jones. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you, uh, colleagues, uh, for your work and for your comments. Uh, at a time like this, Jules, I'm delighted I'm a vegetarian, so that gets me over the hamburger piece. Uh, and I have been asking the leader for a chocolate egg Tesla for quite a while, but it's yet to come through, so we'll, we'll see how that uh, develops. On a more serious note, um, I was very heartened with the presentation that the issues around accessibility and inclusion and ownership were f at the forefront of the thinking. Because like you, the worst thing that could happen is some huge paper bound report uh, that frankly, no one is feeling inspired to wade through. So I think thinking about how you engage different cohorts, communities, bodies, organizations of people is gonna be fundamental to whether or not this actually gets traction over a period of time, but also how you keep it fresh and vital through its life, because it has a lifespan, doesn't it? Uh, and you want it to be continually relevant in one year, five years, 10 years and 20 years. So in a sense, it really does have to be a living thing to make it relevant, for example, to new generations of, uh, of people coming through um, as well. Now, uh, my other thoughts um, were around, first of all, on the vision piece. So I won't comment on the content because many of you have been working on the content, but broadly, you know, a short, sharp, snappy vision is going to have far more impact than lots of bullet points that people probably won't remember. Science will tell you that people can't remember more than seven bullet points at a time uh, anyway. So I like the idea of a much shorter, ambitious, snappy uh, vision. The, uh, the, the issue around the politicians is interesting because we want everybody to feel a sense of ownership of this, don't we? We don't want it just to be the councillors or the council. We want you know, the people out there in Essex communities, the businesses, to all feel that there's something in there that they can relate to and own and bring to life. So that ownership piece is critical. But therefore, also, though, is the accountability piece. Because if you are, in a sense, not wanting this to stay in the hands of politicians, the public should have the right to see who. So who is accountable? Ultimately, for all of this work, 
who is going to be accountable for ensuring that the things do happen? So I think we'll need to think about the governance of the output at the end of this in a way that it does create a sense of accountability uh, within our system. And it springs to mind, I don't know if any of you are familiar with something called the Wigan Deal, uh, which is quite sort of well known in our sector. Uh, and it's not about climate change per se, but it is around uh, uh, an informal agreement between the public bodies and its communities uh, about what the council will do and what it expects people to do and businesses to do. And I think trying to have that kind of mindset about what's the deal then that comes out at the end of this where everybody feels a sense of either personal or organisation accountability and ownership so that everybody moves it forward. I'll probably leave it there, John, if I may. OK, thank you very much. Um, I, I would actually just say on the, on the, on the politicians, I don't think the plan was to have three... I think it was just an example on the front. I, I think there's a good point to put within the report uh, that ownership by, if you like, the political, the political uh, system in, in Essex to show that it isn't just a, a, a completely uh, without backing. Uh, so I think there's a, a, there is a, a, a point there. The other thing I'd just like you to think about while you're listening to the wise words of other people, um, could we even be radical in the thoughts? Because I want to be bold and ambitious in what we're doing. I was just thinking on the report, but people have mentioned, yes, I, I, I'm sure nearly all of you, if not all, everybody, looks at reports and really, quite frankly, they're turgid. You turn off after a while. You may have to read them because it's your job, but it doesn't enthrall you. Is there anything we could do to make this look, I don't know, what the, the the report version of tabloid is or something so that people look at it if it was left lying around in a in a waiting room somewhere people would pick it up and think that looks interesting uh, it's just it's just the thought i had anyway now we're going to go to councillor abbott um thank you chairman yes I, I agree with many of the points made um some suggested possible compromises in terms of the sort of figures who are they're presenting and quoting you you could have a selection so you could have yourself as chairman you could have the leader of the council and maybe um a young person who's talking about the future you know someone who's much younger than most of us on here um but i totally agree that we we and i know you said it was only an example we shouldn't have just three cabinet members you know that is the standard council format we see it on so many reports so i, I totally agree with that i agree with the point about making it clear and succinct and readable but on that point, of course, we don't have to have one version. I mean, Anne mentioned this. We could have, say, three versions. We could have the full WAC PDF. We could have a, a simple guide. And then we could have a web version. So we don't have to have one version. Um, one point I would make very strongly, um, it affects me, but I'm sure it affects other people. I couldn't read a lot of that material on the screen, despite my screen being two foot across. I'm very short-sighted. And I'm sure there are other people with eyesight limitations. So many times these reports come out with tiny, tiny font, which you can't read. And the first thing that someone with limited eyesight will do is say, I'm not even gonna, <laughs> I'm not even gonna start on that because I can't read any of it. So font size is, is really, really important. Um, the, the point that Jules made about consistency, I mean, he gave uh, examples, uh, which I won't do of you know, specific people within the council driving gas guzzling um, vehicles. I mean, obviously that is something the media love to pick up on. I'd like to make a much bigger point about consistency. And this is perhaps controversial, but I think it needs saying. Climate science is fundamental, climate change is fundamentally about science. It's about how we measure how much carbon dioxide and methane and other gases we're putting into the atmosphere and the consequent overall concentration of the gases in the atmosphere and how that affects the climate. And, and then what we're doing is largely policy and small p political responses. Essex County Council and other councils, such as Braintree, which I'm on, are coming up with very good documents like this. But the reality in terms of what they're doing on the ground is different. I've just read a press release about the A120, a new road, four lanes <clears throat> through open countryside to propose to be built between Braintree and the A12. And it's all done in the context of growth. Growth, 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 growth to the ports, growth on this road, more development in the countryside, more light pollution, more energy consumption. The only access that we believe is going to be on that road is a private access to an enormous quarry and a waste incinerator. 
I raised the same issue at Branch Council last night. No one wants to know about it. This waste incinerator is the elephant in the room in climate. And I'd urge everybody on this panel to do a bit of research on it. On its own, it will be the single largest source of carbon dioxide in Essex, pumping out 600,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum, plus the 400 lorry movements per day. That's a gross figure, and I know it's a more complicated picture on net, but it will be an enormous source of carbon dioxide. Now, we can't have all these wonderful policies, and, and, and it's great to hear the language. I've been doing this for over 30 years. So, you know, when I started in the 1980s, there were very few people talking green language. Now, almost everyone's talking green language but there's a disconnect between the policies and aspirations and what's happening on the ground. So my plea to Essex County Council would be the consistency point that Jules made isn't just about individuals. It's about how the council, this council and other councils function corporately and as a whole. And if we're going to tackle climate change, we have to be consistent across the piece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go to Professor McLeod. <laughs> So thanks so much. I mean, I think the comments have been so constructive and uh, I mean, I kind of got a forewarning of them, but I think even now they're so relevant. So I'd like just um, to kind of respond to some of them. And, I, and I, I, I don't mean this in a, I'm taking responsibility for the report, but I can understand having listened to lots of SIGs, how we kind of missed a beat between some of them because so many great ideas came up. But um, what, I would, what I really do see now is that we've missed underlining how creative the SIG outputs were. And, and I agree with uh, some of you who've said that the, the presentations that were made were tremendous. And there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of thought that went into them because we were under such time pressure. So we had to literally put a lot of thought into creating slides that would communicate well. And I think that effort is worth revisiting. And it may even be that we capture what was on some of those slides in the report itself. I'm thinking particularly about the energy and waste one, but there were other really great slides which would convey a lot of information without words. And, and I think we, we need to go back to that. Um, so what I'm hearing, and I think I need to agree with it, is that we need a chunk, and maybe it's through this idea of opening on the independent commissioners as being the, you know, we are the, in a sense, the reason for this report. And then you get how the commissioners worked through the SIG with maybe just one or two very, very compelling um, interactive, well, compelling graphics, um, which could be interactive on the website. So I go back to what Graham was saying, you could have interactive graphics, which if you clicked on the pictures, you would find behind it, all of the data that led to that particular icon being on the graph that we had. I'm thinking about the retrofitting, about that choice inside the, the sort of um, the, the energy part and all of that. So we could, we could bring alive those same creative slides in a way which means that people can dive down into the detail uh, uh, actually on the website itself. So I think rethinking all the materials that we've got would be great. Um, I'm very convinced now about deleting the vision, I must admit. I, I, do, I do sense that we've, we've missed a beat here and it sort of sits a little bit, but maybe one or two meaty statements about what we will do could, could be the substitute for that. So I like that. Um, but what I, what I was really finishing up on was this idea that um, accessibility comes in many different forms. I completely take the point about needing a large print version, totally. You know, I know a lot of people who struggle, but they still would like to be online. Um, so, so let's think about that. But simple devices like uh, having placards of cards and small things that you can have, which you sign up for in schools. Um, so there are many, many ways in which we can cascade this report, which when I was in the UN, that's, that's a lot of what we spent time on, is how to cascade big reports into things which people might have in their, their diary, for example, or, or in their handbag. Or, so, so the messages become the carrier for things you might be doing. I mean, it might be a shopping list. I don't know. All sorts of things, right? So, and it's not just simple product thinking. It's about every time you use it, you see one of those messages. And then there's something with it that tells you, you know, maybe you shouldn't be buying meat today, but, but there are these other recipes. And we could be so much more creative. And I, I take the point. So um, I'm very happy to sort of pitch in with ideas about how that could happen. Um, but I'm putting my vote on more space towards the SIG outputs, maybe less on the kind of large volume of visions and, and statements which don't really lead to anything. And then I would very much like to have an accountability statement for all of the commissioners. 
In other words, we're putting our mouse, we're putting our, our name to this. And I don't mind if it means signing up for certain things, but I think you, you, you lead by, by example. And so maybe there has to be a pledging, even by the commissioners to say, you know, not only do we endorse the report, but here's what it's going to mean for me as a commissioner. So, so some devices like that. Thanks. Thank you very much. We've got Bishop Roger now. Thank you. That's been a, a really uh, interesting uh, conversation so far. Uh, and I think there are some uh, there are some points to pick up that um, there's lots of reassurances. I think I would want to uh, I would want to give from the group that looked at this uh, because actually some of the conversations we're having today simply echo the conversations that the smaller group already had. Uh, we don't want to re to do what normally happens with a report. If if we're honest, uh, and I work for an organisation that is brilliant at producing reports. It's rubbish at effective change. Um, and, and there is something about how we produce, we will have to, I think Jules is right, we will have to produce a report, um, but uh, how do we ensure that this is a report that actually helps people to engage with the contents rather than simply gather dust on a shelf? Uh, and that was very much at the heart of the kind of conversation we were having. I'm conscious in having that conversation that there is a certain degree of straying into the uh, community engagement SIGs area. And there's a real overlap, particularly if we're talking about a suite of products rather than one product, and we're talking about a website and other things, that actually the community engagement SIG and the reporting work of this, uh, of this commission overlap. And, and we might just want to look at that. And, and Graham and others, uh, you know, I'm sure it's not too late to join the community engagement SIG. Uh, and that may be a way around some of that, that stuff, but really, really important. Um, I think the work of the SIGs is core to the report. I think that's always been what, what has been envisaged. But I think there is a kind of, um, if you like, there is a for further reading bit, which is where the technical annex comes in. Uh, I think that it's possible to report on the works of the SIGs fully within the main body of the report, but some people might want to take some of that investigation further. And I think that's where a technical annex comes in. Um, I want to say something about the vision statement. It's, it's the wrong thing to call it, but I think something of that ilk has a value. Uh, let, me, let me explain. I think, I think there are two things that are uh, that are part of the process going forward. There is a period of transition, and there is the change that we are seeking to be part of and implement. And I think the uh, the kind of things that we've talked about in the SIGs, the recommendations of the SIGs, they're kind of tools for enabling that process of transition. Um, but actually, it's really important to, um, to say something about where we're going. What does the changed reality look like? Now, I think we can do that through what uh, Jim Collins and others would refer to as BHAGs, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals. We can have really snappy comments that say this, you know, we will be carbon neutral by 2050, bang you know, simple statements like that. Uh, and I think that's right. There is a place for those targeted, you know, kind of BHAGs or whatever you want to call them. But I think there is also something which kind of says, but what, what will it look like, feel like, be like? What will the reality be like when we get there? Now, I don't think the wording of the statement that's in the report is right. Uh, it doesn't energize, it doesn't excite, it doesn't do what we want it to do. But I think there is a descriptive piece that says, if we're moving from the current reality to the new reality, what does that new reality look like? Uh, and to begin to articulate in creative language and in evocative language, something of the benefits of getting to that place. So we've got the directions, a bit like sat-nav commands, that will be the the bit that the, uh, the SIGs are produced, this is how we get there. But I think we want to talk about what is, what is it gonna be like when we get there? Uh, and, and I think something that is snappy, 
that is beautifully written that describes that gives an incentive to then go through the hard work of doing what, what the recommendations say to do. Uh, so I think there is a place for that, but it's not a vision statement. It's not a set of goals. And uh, it probably needs somebody with some really good creative writing techniques to write it, to, to describe that new reality. The, the final thing just to say is around this thing about hypocrisy. Um, uh, I think it's a point well made, but actually I think you'll get more buy-in and will be of greater assistance to the general public if we actually talk about our real and honest struggle with this stuff rather than parading our green credentials. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm involved in uh, a festival that took the decision to go plastic free. Um, and, and actually what we realize is that's really, really difficult. Um, and in fact, we still haven't done it. We're, we're eliminating different bits of plastic each time we have the festival. Uh, but I'm conscious as, as somebody who runs a stage that we use a huge amount of cable ties that are thrown away at the end of the festival. So how do we eliminate those? So each time there's a kind of struggle to say, how, how can we be more authentically what we want to be? And I think, I think it would be better for commissioners to talk about the real and honest struggle with this stuff than to appear that we are greener than green, um, which I try to be, but I certainly am not at the moment. That's all from me. Thank you very much, Bishop Roger. Um, I'm, I'm running into the time that we've got allotted for talking about vision statement, because I think we're actually de dealing with that in our, in our discussion. So I, I'm just gonna let this flow a bit more. Um, uh, next, I've got Rob Wise. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I think I want to focus a little bit on the issue of looking forwards and what the doing is actually going to look like, because I would agree with many of the comments that have been made uh, about uh, the draft so far in terms of the lack of emphasis on what's come out of the six. Um, and less on visions, etc. So I think you know, the point is the SIGs have come up with a lot of recommendations about things to do. And this report needs to be focused on the doing uh, rather than too much of the context setting. And in that regard, I wanted to sort of bring up something about timelines uh, of this report in relation uh, to the work of the council itself, because here we are sitting today talking about the drafting, the final drafting of a report to be published by the end of June, when earlier today, as I understand it from press releases from the county council, the cabinet met to review our interim recommendations, etc., and has uh, taken some of them forward very specifically, put some of them slightly more on hold, etc. And it seems to me that if we're not publishing a report until the end of June, we need to be acknowledging what we have achieved vis-a-vis -vis the council in that report. And so we need a little bit of a scorecard as part of the report that actually says, look, the six came up with all these recommendations and look, in March, and maybe at a subsequent cabinet meeting yet, uh, there will be further adoptions by the County Council of some of what we were doing. And maybe the adoptions of new activities uh, like the Net Zero Innovation Network that is effectively picking up on many of the recommendations coming out of the engagement SIG, but giving it a new name that I don't think we had in that SIG at some point. So I think there is very much an interactive element of the timelines between what we can say in this final report, uh, year one report by at the end of June, as compared to what we've been discussing so far in the draft. I mean, the draft uh, in terms of the slide deck, it takes us 10, half of the deck to get to the recommendations stage. So I think there is a rebalancing that needs to be done there, but I do think 
nobody has really addressed this issue of the feedback loop between the council's actions and the recommendations, because that is dynamic. It's happened today. We need to incorporate it in some way in our report. Thank you. I've got three more uh, commissioners to go to. I've got Ian Davidson next, then Robert Mitchell, and uh, then Joe Roberts. So, uh, Ian. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, a few points I just want to make, and actually some a lot of them echo what Roger said, um, because I do think that um, probably that list is the wrong title or vision, and I do think, some, as agree with many, something shorter and sharper. Um, but I think we do need something along those, along those lines, whatever the title we may give it, because I think we've got to remember that this document is not just for those who are already the converts. It's those who are also on the journey. And if you just use some blithe sort of sweeping statement, which is um, something which pe people cannot get, get their, their heads around, they will ignore it. Whereas if you have a number of things within it, then they can say, yes, I can associate with that one. Not a lot to do with on that one. I can work with that one. So I think, I think the, the, the good thing around the 10 points is it takes people on a journey. It helps them to, to, to work through what some of the things can, can be done. Um, I think the other issue is, is if you strip everything out of it, it will become superficial. You will not get the level of granularity in there to say, these are some of the things which actually can be done. These are the things where you can make a difference. And I absolutely agree with, with, with Roger. And so, you know, it, it's all very good for us to turn around and say, yes, this must happen. Yes, we must do it. But we've got to remember that actually it's going to be a real struggle taking organisations, taking our partners, and they are our partners, on a journey, taking our partners so that they, that they sign up to that, that journey. And let me give you one example, tourism. So are we parochial? But tendering, we really, we really rely for our economy on tourism. For people to, that means people traveling. And to travel, that means obviously is, is, is that it's a much, it's, um, you know, cars coming, cars going, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not easy to get here to get by train. So it's a journey to say, how do you make that transition? How do you make it easier for people to get here? But it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And actually, it's going to be quite a difficult sell at times to our local politicians to, to invest significant money, um, Ivan, to invest significant money um, and to, uh, in order to highlight things like the Mayflower 400. There, I've got, I've got a little plug in for it. Um, but, you know, it is a really big issue around taking people on that journey. So be careful about stripping everything out because actually it loses the granularity, it loses the, the, the and becomes superficial. And actually it is a really good document to help people go on a journey rather than it just being sold, sold to the converted. Right, thanks. And I can see why people flock to tendering with the alts, uh, the high spots of uh, Essex behind you. Of course, I would um, say it's just outside Manningtree, um, but um, that's actually a picture I took of Everest. <laughs> oh, all right. Fair enough. Uh, Councillor Robert Mitchell, please. Having flown there, I imagine. <laughs> well, very close to it. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, yes, certainly, Jules, Simon and many others have mentioned the, what I would call the KISS principle. We do need to keep certain bits simple, short, short sharp and accessible. It's, about, it's all about, isn't it, personal, individual and collective responsibility for getting things right. We can't all be perfect, but we can all make a difference. Uh, when we were talking about statements, we were discussing before about Solar Together and other schemes like that and about becoming potentially the first uh, renewable powered county. Now, there's a big push going with Solar Together at the moment. We've had over 4,000 uh, people have registered for it. That's going to be uh, going to auction next week. Uh, and then we'll see how that works with the number of people who end up with, and businesses, put solar stuff on their roofs and or um, batteries for having to be more resilient and more sustainable in power. So it's a useful one we can start with. I do have a little issue, and James will know I, I do, about the uh, waste management facility at, at Rivenhall. We don't have real alternatives to incineration uh, certainly using the most up-to-date technology rather than taking waste away to somewhere else to an older, less efficient incinerator. It's, uh, it's a difficult 
uh, balanced a tie completely. But uh, I don't know the exact answer. Uh, cable ties, Roger, uh, just check the chat. They can get reusable ones. I likewise have a grotty, I don't say grotty, it's a very efficient and regularly or, or not very often used diesel car. I want an electric car sooner rather than later if I absolutely need to replace it. But it's a difficult balance because actually getting rid of an old car is a big carbon impact as well when you're then buying another one. Difficult balance, and I spent my life in difficult balance because, of course, I used to be flying a pair of gas turbine helicopter engines uh, using horrible amounts of fossil fuels. But just quickly on the big, uh, the big companies, the big oil companies, they are investing massively in alternatives, in renewable alternatives. And the money that they have to be able to invest, the likes of BP uh, and Shell, is not necessarily a reason to with, withdraw all uh, sort of pension uh, things in, from, from those fossil fuel companies, because they actually are part of the future as well. They're all investing. My brother works for AirBP. They're desperately wanting to find decent aviation fuel that will that is effectively renewable. Thank you, Robert. And then I've now got Joe, uh, Joe Roberts to, to come in and perhaps to wind this, this, this section up. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I think I just wanted to feedback that I think um, there've been some very interesting motivational things. I think Jackie's ideas about how we make this very palatable. I think Jules's idea about how we actually are accountable is really important. I think following up on what Jules was saying, I think we've got to be very careful we don't name and shame. And I'm not saying Jules for one minute that that's what you were insinuating. Please don't get me wrong on that. But I think it can become incredibly demotivating for people if we, we play on, we've got to find a balance between more carrots and less sticks, but to motivate. And yesterday, um, I was lucky enough to work with Simon Walsh and, and Toddington and others with a, a wonderful young woman. I don't know what school she came from, but she talked about how difficult it is um, to be standing up for the environment when other young people thought that she wasn't very cool. Um, and she was saying, what can you do to sort of help me come up with ideas that could help influence others? I thought it was a really interesting discussion that we had. And I'm actually thinking that I don't know how possible it'll be, but whether we actually take our kind of coming to the end of our report to two schools and parish councils and some of those community bodies to actually run some focus groups, you know, is this actually helpful? Is this touching, you know, touching in where we need to be? And just seeing whether we can get some feedback um, on how, how we're coming up, even maybe whether there was some designing that gets involved with the council um, in the final production of it, that it doesn't then feel like a corporate document, that it's got some flair to it that's been, been put in. Um, the other thing I think, just going back to the report, and, and we've discussed this a lot together, is you know, even Attenborough's programs, I've heard my daughter say, you know, this really upsets me, but, but what do I do now and how do we do it? And I think it's kind of, again, going back to this idea of making sure that there's some tangible, meaningful, steps that people can take that are constructive and forward-looking rather than punitive and damning, um, but also really helping people with actions. And, and again, we discussed in our small group around this kind of structure for the report, maybe having a pull out of Jules's ideas about the 10 quick steps that everybody could do. You know, let's try and make it biteable, tangible, meaningful for people. Um, and again, I think we'll be doing a lot more work on, on how we take this forward. Um, thank you. Thank you. I've just got one, a last hand up from Councillor Peter Davy, if he wants to just come in. Thank you, John. Um, community engagement and the marketing of this report, I think, is what it's all about, because whatever form that report takes, what we need to do is market it in advance of its launch, because it's going to be a big document, however you look at it. And I, I, I believe in the process of teasers going out into social media actually you know in a graphical way making people aware that something is coming and that they should be reading it and, and embracing it and and another way of separating this report out to make it feel less uh, arduous to read is to actually color code the six segments that we've actually put into the report so it breaks it out or 
you can also do four page summaries of the report of each particular SIG effort that's been put into the commission so that people can actually, if they want to, pick which report they wish to read and embrace as opposed to, as opposed to being switched off by um, an owner's report, which they get through four or five pages and then say, oh, I can't cope with all this. And finally, uh, I do believe that by showing by example, and certainly uh, of late, there's, got, there's been some very good carbon footprint analysis being um, sent out into the marketplace, including one called the carbon footprinting tool. And this gives an indicator of how much carbon each civil parish is using and breaks this down by themes such as industrial and commercial, road transport, housing, and lets you compare your parish statistics to the national average. It also provides easily interpretable data to all communities and gives them a clear idea of their leading impact area where community-based action can make a dent in local emissions. You know, it's another useful tool which you can relate to and carbon footprinting is what it's all about. So in summary, I'm saying that it's critical that we market this report in the correct way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that's been a, a very interesting discussion to say the least. Um, one point that I think uh, Joe just meant, which was, actually I was struggling to think of a, the appropriate word. I was came up with road test, but of course focus groups is the answer. Not to, to, for different, it might be different age groups, maybe different, but just to see how they react to some of these things. Uh, it's a shame. I don't think we've got on the call today the two youth uh, vice chair, deputy chairman. Uh, it would be interesting to have their view of reports because uh, it, we are trying to target this a lot of people, and that's what um, uh, we will have to try. It's a really difficult uh, thing to try and achieve. Anyway, I'm going to now hand over, but finally, I'm sorry, Sam, we're a bit late uh, to you for your review of the year two uh, plan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Nicole, it's, it's, uh, uh, thankfully, this will hopefully be relatively short. So thank you, Nicole, for putting up the slides. If we could just move on to the next slide, please. So this is just a quick recap of the original terms of reference of the um, uh, Climate Commission. The full terms of reference were sent out uh, in the papers with the, for the meeting. But um, <clears throat> just uh, to recall that the Commission was originally set up as a two-year endeavour. And uh, the first year really focusing on um, how what we needed to do to mitigate uh, the climate, climate change uh, challenge. Um, but the second year is focusing on how we unlock investment in natural capital and low carbon growth. Um, and, uh, uh, and moving from a really regular drumbeat of um, commission meetings, we've had nine, this is our ninth one this year, to less frequent, um, but not losing the focus on uh, kind of uh, delivery against some of the recommendations that have been made this year. So the draft proposal for next year, if we could move to the next slide, please, is that as we've discussed, we, we launched the report uh, in the summer. So the proposal is the end of June, dates TBC. And then we have four formal meetings like this um, in year two uh, across these core themes. So um, a green growth plan for Essex. So how do we ensure that the monies being invested in Essex are supporting a move towards net zero rather than further away and addressing some of the resilience recommendations that have been made this year. Uh, the second meeting, looking at uh, how we're doing on, on delivering um, and developing action plans to enable delivery against the recommendations that the Commission's made. Uh, and then a deep dive on green finance and how we unlock some of the new um, financial um, mechanisms and, and pots of money that are coming forward, looking for a home in green growth and then the final year really looking back we will have uh, by then we hope have our first kind of progress report um and and be able to make some recommendations it's sort of a review of what's happened and, and uh, recommendations going forward so i suppose that was um that was a a, a, a high level outline for the work of the commission next year 
um, which I think is in line with um, the terms of reference as originally set, set out. Um, but I'd really welcome um, some comments, uh, any thoughts, any additions, any suggestions on changes um, for this um, so we can finalise a year two uh, um, work plan for, for the Commission for next year. Excellent. Thanks very much. Anybody got any uh, any comments on that? Is that that's a hand gone up, Jules? Yeah, just a, a small one for me. Thanks, thanks, Sam. That's great. Could I just urge, and I know it's sometimes difficult to do this, that we um, have meetings in the diary quite a long way in advance um, uh, to to be asked to come to a meeting next week or in two weeks' time or three weeks time, it's just kind of, you know, it's impossible. You know, we're doing this whilst we're working. We're not, we're not um, uh, got our feet up in between the meetings, mostly. Um, yeah. Sometimes. But so I, it's, just, I, it's just, you know, once we've got that plan, could we just set out and, and you know, where appropriate, use doodle polls to make sure that members of SIGS or this commission can, can actually get to them and then have kind of automatic populating of calendars. You know, these are, these are brilliant basics. They're not, much more than that, but they can frustrate when when it seems to go wrong. Thanks. No, absolutely, more, more than happy to do that. We are working to finalise dates at the moment and we'll send those out as soon as we possibly can. Professor McGlade. Thanks a lot. Yes, I was thinking that um, a really important piece of work for this commission next year is to begin to see the implementation. And, and to take a very proactive role. And I hope that's going to be part of our work where we get sort of maybe report backs and where we're really engaging with the next stages. In other words, we won't leave it behind. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we could organize if COVID's over a site visit, you know, to our, into our climate action area. It, it, I just feel that we need to keep on coming back to this. Um, and and uh, it's almost like, you know, we had the rehearsal now, now we're going to put on the play and this is actually going to be it. So year two, is where we do it. We seem to be doing it. And we can even, I don't know, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but I think it would be great to meet some of the local communities who we wanted to influence. So is, is there a chance for us to do that? That's what I'm asking. Thank you. A sort of um, commission on tour, I think, is what you're suggesting. And I don't think it's a bad well, um, Yes, boots on the ground. Yes, exactly. Simon can put us up. We can go and visit <laughs> all kinds of things. But yes, yes. No, I think it'd be very valid. Um, Simon, Mr. Uh, th thank you, John. Um, actually, I mean, Jackie said pretty much what I was going to say. I mean, I I've got really inspired and in and sort of everything, engaged, enthusiastic by being on the SIG, particularly I spent time on the land use SIG and what this commission's come up with. And I really want to spend some time helping make sure it's implemented and doing everything I can to help implementation. So although I think it's great, uh, Sam, that your plan talks about the green growth plan and green finance, all of both very important. I would really like to see more emphasis on the action plans against recommendations. And, and, and indeed, I'd be happy to see the, I don't know if others would, but personally, I'd be happy to see the SIGs continue, but with a mandate on, well, what are you going to do to implement it? What are these action plans? How can we help? Um, you know, I think, I don't know if Rob Wise is still on the call, but um, um, earlier this week, DEFRA announced its sustainable farming initiative pilot. Um, and of course, if we're going to, oh, good, Rob's come back. <laughs> but but I was just, I mean, more or less, you know, I was immediately thinking, wow, we need to get as many farmers as we can, you know, encouraged and engaged in this sustainable farming initiative. And, you know, how can I work with Rob? What can I do to help? Who else? Water companies? You know, what partners can we get involved in trying to make sure that there's maximum take up for these things so that we see our SIG, our SIG recommendations start starting to be implemented. So for me, that's the most important thing I would like to spend time of in year two. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, and, but I do think implementation is, 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 is crucial if this is going to happen. And we've all said that the work needs to be done in the next 10 years rather than wait till 2040 and then panic. And, and so, you know, I, I I'm really want to sort of keep going in, in terms of encouraging the implementation. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to go uh, to Sam next, and I can see that Victoria Hill's put her hand up as well. 
Thank you. Um, so, uh, Simon, I'd hope that, um, that those who are involved in SIG working groups will have already um, uh, kind of agreed amongst themselves that I certainly the feedback I've had from all of the SIG leads is that absolutely uh, commissioners are, are in that space. And uh, well, there's certainly no uh, proposal here that we would disband the existing working groups. They will keep going. And for those commissioners that can continue to give their time, uh, we absolutely want to work with you on implementation the, the the headline meetings that i've set out are what are we going to come back and discuss at these meetings where we include everyone and i think if if it would be helpful we can think about how we structure um uh, uh activity updates for every meeting as well as the deep dive ones but certainly the c groups that are working um on uh, that have worked up the recommendations in each of the areas we would really want to work with commissioners as long as humanly possible, actually, in terms of turning those recommendations into deliverable action plans, um, dependent on uh, your level of involvement, only dependent on how much time you're able to give. So uh, we really welcome that. Thank you. I, I do like the suggestion from Councillor Walsh about visiting the uh, beaver colony at Fitchingfield. But um, I think we go now to Victoria Hills. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, just to reinforce that, actually, um, just this morning I was catching up with my SIG lead and we were, we've were we already moved into implementation in some respects. I was joining the dots up with um, our, our particular area was housing and a meeting on, on net zero. And off the back of the conversations we've had this morning, um, moving into uh, introducing him to new developers that they've not heard of, that they need to know about, who are already de delivering this elsewhere in the country. So um, obviously there will be a limit to time, but where I can still add value by um, sharing that knowledge um, or you know, that I can bring in from elsewhere to help with that implementation, that's certainly um, where we started with the built environment. Um, and uh, some of the, in fact, one of the, one of the actions I think they told me this morning they've already delivered so uh, this is before we've launched it so I completely support those comments thank you that's excellent I've got Mark uh, Mark Carroll now would like to come in uh, thanks very much and I suppose it's just really building on on those comments about year two what is extraordinary to me about the commission is not just the quality of the work but actually for Essex it is it is the movement that will create the change and you all tap into much bigger and wider networks. Some of you um, have been involved in this, in these issues, as, as I heard you say, for 30 years or more. Um, but there is a now a really powerful movement of connected people in Essex and making that really work. So the way that Victoria just described, you know, the work that we're going to do with developers over the next year is absolutely crucial because this is, you know, there's a lot of conversation about what does the report look like. But actually, what is really going to make the difference in Essex is what we do with real, real groups of people, whether that's farmers or whether that's developers or whether it's the county council or whether it's the public sector or it's energy and utility. So I think those points by Simon, Victoria, others about really focusing on how we use the power to create change is the thing that is the second year. So the meetings coming together to, to, to get, take sense of that, take stock of where progress is happening. But I think that there's a real motor for change here. So I think of it much more as a social movement in the second year that I do a commission in a formal way. You've done all the evidence, you've produced recommendations, now it's turning it into something. Right, thank you. And in, in a way, I, I think in a, in a very simplistic way, when uh, we've mentioned earlier about perhaps doing minutes, it's almost like with the beginning of each me meeting we had a we had a sort of matters arising and it basically what has what has been done with the things that we've suggested how far they've been advanced rather than just sending them out there into the ether saying this is a jolly good idea what we want to know what is happening it may not be for the next meeting but that's what that's what i think we've got to do uh, i can't see any more hands up does anybody want to say anything else no well i'd really like to just say thank you to everybody uh for all their hard work over this past year. Um, little did we think when, uh, I remember having the first, it wasn't a meeting, but I met with Sam and, and I think Mark and the two uh, young people up in the Houses of Parliament and, and COVID was just beginning to hit the headlines, but none of us would have realized that this commission was going to have to work in these conditions. Uh, 
from my point of view, it's been a fantastic experience this first year. I'm just uh, amazed by the, the, the expertise, the knowledge, the enthusiasm and the passion of, of you all. And from all your different uh, uh, perspectives, I think we've got some fantastic uh, suggestions. We have got to make them into uh, reality as best we can. We don't. I, I've seen too many times. I'm sure many of you have. Uh, it's not just uh, Bishop Bishop Rogers' um, uh, outfit that do reports and then uh, leave them dusty, getting accumulating dust. I'm afraid uh, in my uh, old world or current world, I suppose you could say. That's very much the, the system. So um, I just I really just want to ju just say thank you. And, and the work goes on. Let's look forward. I don't envy uh, those people getting the, the next draft of the final report together because we've heard all sorts of things. It's, it, it, it's, but let's see what we can do. Um, I hope we can have a launch event in June. Um, I would it, it would be really nice if we could actually meet in person. I may have to get my hair cut. I may have to actually put a pair of trousers on. Um, but um, uh, I'd be very nice to see it. One final plea for the report I was going to say earlier before I went into my oh, uh, my, 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 my um, praise for you all was please don't forget those doing the report about the, the natural world because the climate is, is in, 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 inextricably linked with the, the loss of biodiversity. And I think that is something that really strikes home at, at, at a lot of people and I think that's a good way into some of this anyway let's hope we get a launch in June and then we'll start uh, the work again so uh, with a year two starting in September thank you all very much stay safe look after yourselves and um, see you soon Bye. We thank you John for chairing us so well absolutely thanks very much John thanks everybody see you next time bye-bye